Thank you very much, John. And uh, feel free to interrupt at any time with any question. All questions are good questions. Some may be better than others. Uh, the question of telemedicine is relatively new to many of us, although teleradiology has been around for decades. So the intent here is to first review the Medical Practice Act laws, define what telemedicine is and how the medical board is approaching it, uh, then show some examples of uh, where the Federation of State Medical Boards is coming from, uh, some of the very strong pluses, particularly at Medical University and uh, USC in the state, uh, then show some contrasting cases and then uh, close on a new bill on telemedicine that's currently in our legislature. Okay, uh, and again, you have these on your slide deck, although I've updated these since uh, we submitted our original presentation a month ago. So if you wanna get the update and you have your flash drive with you, the gentleman in the back will be happy to uh, copy it down for you, and it'll also be posted on the website um, after all of this, this new one. Medical Practice Act, uh, which is uh, section 4047, practice of medicine means, and you see the various definitions there, I won't bore you with these, but um, this has been now a hot topic, using the designation doctor, physician, etc. And we've seen some resolutions that uh, we beg your consideration for. And, and this is really where it boils down to, that, uh, who is a doctor, who is a physician. Uh, a major issue. Continuing on with the Medical Practice Act, it is critical to establish a doctor-patient relationship as a prerequisite to prescribing. And so it's all about prescribing drugs, as we've just heard from Dr. Apt about online pharmacies and prescribing. It's one thing to be a teleradiologist in California reading an x-ray. It's another thing to be uh, physically located in South Carolina and teleprescribe, and, and we'll focus on the more on the teleprescribing than on, on just about any other as aspect. Uh, but uh, uh, it's unprofessional to prescribe without establishing a doctor-patient relationship, which includes face-to-face, -face, uh, history and physical. You know the old mantra from medical school, when all else fails, do a history and physical. Anyway, and, uh, and so that's part of the basic requirements. And you heard Dr. Costa in his comments yesterday talk about 113, and we'll look further at that. Uh, there are some exceptions there. Uh, uh, if you've not personally examined, uh, you, you can write ad admission orders for newly hospitalized patient uh, before you actually see the patient. That's an exception. That's okay, as long as you very soon thereafter see the patient. You can prescribe for patient with another licensee if you're taking call, and many of us have done that. When we have group practice, you may get a call at night for something as simple as uh, cystitis, for example. And that's okay to phone in a prescription, but with the advent of electronic health records, as we've heard from Dr. Coulter and others this morning, it's going to be easier to verify that patient is indeed a, a uh, practice patient in your group uh, rather than just somebody calling in. Uh, you do not phone in narcotics, however. Uh, that's, that's one of the, the, the no-nos. Um, a license, uh, uh, you can uh, prescribe for a patient that's been examined by a physician extender, and there may be some others. Um, the real kicker here is prescribing drugs to individual the licensee is never personally examined based solely on answers to a set of questions is unprofessional, and the medical board has sanctioned physicians for doing just that. Uh, online question, you, uh, you log on, you provide your credit card information, you answer a set of questions just like Dr. Ab said, and, uh, and then get a prescription. And that is unprofessional uh, according to our Practice Act. We're one of the stricter ones in the country. There are some that are loose, quite loose in, in that, as we'll hear from our uh, attorney closing. Our question is, is it ethical and legal for an on-call physician to call a prescription um, if you never personally examined that patient? And the answer to that is yes, it, it is legal and it is ethical. But some sort of verification must be made if nothing more than verbal communication to the primary care physician in your group uh, the next day that you phoned in uh, XYZ for that patient that night. Okay. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I got very interested in this, and uh, with the uh, push by dozens of national teleradiology groups, and teleradiology has been around a while, 
established at the medical board a telemedicine committee. Dr. David DeHall, who is Vice President of Anderson Neary Medical Center, is the chair. I couldn't afford to be a chair of anything else. So Dave chairs it, and, and he and I are on it, and then uh, Dr. Robert Adams at MUSC and a few others are on it too. And we see uh, telemedicine as a tool, not as a standard of care or practice of medicine. And we see it primarily as uh, consultative services. Uh, pressure to depart from this consultative only model is where we are at this point in time because telemedicine really ideally should be more tele uh, consultative rather than direct care and consultative between two licensed physicians or pro uh, pro providers of different types. We know that teleradiology, telepathology, teleneurology, long distance reading of nerve conduction studies, et cetera, have been going on for a long time, and those are teletechnical services. So um, we, in this uh, draft policy that we're going to finalize this year, uh, we make it very clear that physician response to the questions is clearly unprofessional, again, underscoring that uh, uh, approach there. And we have indeed denied licenses on that basis come, uh, for applicants coming into South Carolina. Um, it's to ensure that we receive the best of the benefits and avoid uh, qu high quality patient physician interaction. But we recognize also that there are situations in which there's limitation of providers and we have to make some allowances. And you heard Dr. Costa's comment yesterday at the opening uh, uh, House of Delegates that uh, we are working with other providers to uh, perhaps negotiate some distance and other uh, aspects of this. Um, in general, uh, using this table model, we have three types. A, a technical service such as radiology, neurology, standard. All uh, such telemedicine physicians, regardless of what state they live in, have to have a state medical license and we also require them to provide written protocols for communicating critical results. We have denied licenses. If they don't have a protocol for calling in critical results, a teleradiologist does not get a license in South Carolina, straightforward. And, but then that's essential. If you got a critical result in your uh, office, uh, you would call and contact the patient too, as soon as possible. If you had especially a super critical result, like a radiologist uh, pops up on the screen at 10 o'clock at night, uh, subdural hematoma on a patient who was just sent in to an outpatient imaging facility Friday afternoon at uh, 6 just for a headache and at 10 o'clock at night the radiologist sees a subdural, how is that radiologist going to communicate those findings? Well, if it's an emergency room, there's usually a warm body there 24-7, but if it's an outpatient Doc Jones who puts his phone on uh, answering machine at 4 p.m. Friday afternoon saying the office is closed, call back Monday. If you have an emergency, call 911. That's unsatisfactory and the imaging facility is closed, so what does the teleradiologist do? There has to be a protocol. In other words, if all else fails, call the patient directly. That's the only responsible thing to do. That's the ethical thing to do for tele-technical services. Teleconsultative services actually uh, we envision as between two healthcare providers, ideally physicians, but physician extenders are the gray zones here. And great examples of this are telepsychiatry, teleneurology, stroke care, and again, written protocols. And, uh, and when we interview, and one of the advantages of South Carolina Medical Board is that we require a face-to-face -face interview universally for all applicants although I help establish an exception for teleradiologists. We do that by Skype, but it's still face-to-face, -face, but it's the use of technology to do the interview process. Um, <clears throat> and they, the teleconsult uh, consultant provides only clinical advice. It is the responsibility of the boots on the ground, emergency room doctor or primary care provider to actually prescribe the medication and be responsible for the side effects because the teleconsultant at MUSC or USC or wherever they are uh, is not always available 24-7. Anyway, and then we have the uh, direct to consumer teleprimary care, the phone -a doc or email -a doc. And there are uh, several groups in South Carolina. I Select MD has been the premier group. Uh, the others that are too numerous to count. 
and they have to be vetted by our committee. And we usually require the medical director of these companies to make a, an appearance before the full board with their protocols before we'll even consider granting them a license to practice. And, uh, and then we need data outcome to really prove that point. So we're getting stricter and stricter on this last group. Now, here's my uh, take on it. The plain vanilla of, of the teleradiology, that's straightforward, that's been around for decades. Um, the chocolate or richer flavor, telepsychiatry, telestroke medicine, we have some great examples in South Carolina. And then I call this uh, last group the rainbow with nuts flavor, the, the phonodoc, if you will. And uh, these exist in many states already, uh, especially in, out west where you can't find a physician for 50 miles. You may have an APRN or a PA. Now, there are some exceptions to this. A uh, physician takes a call for group. We've established that. A psychiatrist who uh, establishes a bona fide relationship in person then conducts follow-ups by electronic means. Dr. Roberts is a great example of that. You do an initial face-to-face, -face, and you do a physical exam, basically a mental status exam, although you will shake their hand and hold their hand, uh, but that's, that's the, the, the essential face-to-face -face encounter. Others are, include phone-in post-exposure prophylaxis of household contacts of specific communicable diseases. And uh, John, I'm going to ask you in a minute if you would pass these out to everybody here uh, j in, in just a minute when I get to that particular point here because we now, through medical board policy, have the ability to phone in prescriptions for people you have never and will never lay eyes on. Uh, post-exposure prophylaxis for certain communicable diseases when necessary. Dr. Limehouse uh, uh, has been breaking the South Carolina Medical Practice Act law for years and years and years when he treats a case of meningococcal meningitis. Little Johnny comes in with fever, headache, stiff neck, purple rash, in shock. You know what he's got. He gets maximum full core press up to the ICU. And you will prescribe post-exposure prophylaxis, Cipro 500, uh, for each of the household contacts. Little ones may get rifampin or a rocephin injection. But in general, you'll write a, a, bu a bunch of Cipro, one prescription, uh, the seven household contacts. Each person take one pill stat. Well, you don't have a doctor-patient relationship with those people, but you do make a note in Johnny's chart that you have pepped uh, um, mother Susie, father John, et cetera, et cetera, and that's all it takes. You've been following public health guidelines for years. The CDC has always recommended that these kinds of procedures be done. They've just never recommended who writes their prescriptions. So you, you've been doing exactly the right thing although it's been against state law, but the medical board policy has been when you follow public health guidelines, you are, although technically breaking the law, you are following standard of care, which trumps the law because after all the law was written by our legislatures. <laughs> anyway, so last year I had the honor of representing South Carolina, the Federation of State Medical Boards, the national first and only so far, a national meeting on telemedicine that was held in Washington, D.C., March of, uh, of last year. And, uh, and it's, no one knows the definition of telemedicine. A lot of confusion and a lot of variation. Now, the House of Delegates uh, 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 were divided over this. We know some of the data, growing population. We've seen the demand. We've seen the physician shortage. Really, it's a maldistribution of physicians rather than an absolute shortage uh, more than anything else with older Americans looking for telemedicine to address some of these access. And it's now being promoted as the solution to limited access and higher cost of care to help reduce costs. When they tell you it's not about the money, you can better believe it's all about the money. Anyway, um, Representative Paulson, Republican Minnesota, has introduced a bill in Congress to allow for two things. Number one, a uh, national licensure program, and number two, uh, telemedicine in all forms, including voice, mail, email, et cetera, without requiring a patient-physician relationship. And uh, a lot of us had some serious concerns about that. The FSMB's uh, board came up with these obstacles and challenges, and you can read them like I can. 
they're just a strange admixture, a potpourri of, of types of technologies and infrastructures. But the awareness and understanding is, is just as unfocused. But look at this particular ch obstacle and challenge to telemedicine that the medical boards came up with. The traditional view of medicine favors a face-to-face patient-physician interaction. That is seen as an obstacle, by the way, by most states in this country. And those of us from South Carolina and North Carolina strongly objected and spoke up and said so. Anyway, uh, but that is, that is where we, the rubber hits the road there, that we need that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Now, they also provided a telemedicine overview by state of what kind of license is required, and various states require various types of license. Special volunteer license, special training, temporary license, uh, unrestricted, South Carolina. Uh, requires a full medical license. Some have a limited license. There are variations between states. This uh, solution to medical licensure and telemedicine is, is not going to come anytime soon. I can guarantee you that. Now, a few good examples of where it works and works well. Here's a great example. Medical University uh, Stroke Center. Comprehensive Stroke Cerebrovascular Center in which there are multiple screens and in uh, must be at least 20 emergency facilities around the state, small hospitals now around the state. They have a RoboCam, a high resolution webcam, audio and visual, where the emergency room physician or in rare cases the PA with a physician down the hall or in the offices next door or so on gets in a patient with a stroke and they uh, do a, a scan of some type and the physicians at MUSC in Charleston can see the patient. They can instruct the physician extender to do certain types of procedures and uh, physical exam maneuvers, et cetera. They can see the results of the imaging. They can see the lab results on a whole set of screens. Looks like something out of a NASA space station. And then they can advise the local emergency room doctor whether or not to prescribe uh, TPA, the clot-busting drug, for thrombotic stroke versus a hemorrhagic stroke. That's ideal. It works, and it works well. And that uh, program is now exemplified by Dr. Robert Adams um, and, uh, uh, and his group, and we've invited him to serve on our medical board telemedicine committee. So this is an example of where telemedicine works well. Dr. Adams doesn't do the prescribing, local doctor does, but he offers a consultative advice. Okay, here's another example. Uh, uh, the Department of Mental Health has a telepsychiatry program, just like the VA system has a telepsychiatry program. The VA, however, doesn't work through physicians or PAs, and they, they use licensed social workers as their extenders in their remote clinics. Uh, a little marginal, but that's the VA system over which the medical board has no control. But here, the Department of Mental Health got an award, Psychiatric Services, for their telemedicine uh, initiative. Um, and, and USC has been working very closely with them. So kudos to them, which is why I put the smiley face there on the slide. Another example of uh, one of the best, and, and both of these programs serves, uh, serve as models for the nation. There are other states that have contacted these groups uh, and say, how'd you do it? How'd you set it up, et cetera? And MUSC has also added a, uh, a, a, an IT officer, Dr. Robert Warren, recently, who is uh, a master at telemedicine, set up the system in Texas, starting with UT in Galveston. Here's an example of a medical board. Uh, this is North Carolina Medical Board newsletter. The, they have the luxury of sending out a newsletter periodically. Our legislature, in their infinite wisdom, cut funding to LLR. That You haven't seen a medical board newsletter in four and a half years, have you? No. Uh, we can't send out a newsletter thanks to uh, limited funding. But uh, here's the North Carolina Medical Board President, uh, Jan Huff. It says, a, a patient who may or may not have an established provider calls 800 number with a credit card to talk to a random doctor physician. Somebody claims they're a doctor or nurse practitioner, describes symptoms, receives a diagnosis and a prescription, which is uh, transmitted to the local pharmacy. Are those good medicine? Is that good medicine? Uh, the answer is probably not. Uh, it's definitely more accessible and cheaper 
But she would argue, and I would argue, that quality of care provided in such a scenario is at least debatable. And, and, and I think that's where the argument is now. It's debatable, it's arguable, it's marginal. The Federation also shared uh, some uh, conflicting opinions. Federation of State Medical Board says this uh, news. The American Telemedicine Association, which has been around and very powerful and very well funded, they've launched last year a fixed licensure, one size fits all. If you're licensed in one state, yeah, there is interstate reciprocity. You can be licensed and do anything you want in any state. You can phone in prescriptions for a relative in Timbuktu or California or, or whatever. And so there's this national system for a single licensure system for healthcare professionals. And they have their own website. Here's the ATA, American Telemedicine Association website. And they now have an online petition that is gaining huge momentum that the Federation of State Medical Boards in its divided approach to this is way behind the eight ball. And so well, we've got a long way to go. And this group, the ATA, has now hired a firm uh, to help ensure that uh, they remove all barriers to medical licensure, in, including the requirement for face-to-face -face, uh, physical patient interaction. And th th this is the, the future of where this uh, group is going, which is why you don't see a happy face up there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, this is their marketing firm, LexisNexis. So if you get a letter from LexisNexis, um, please understand that they are pushing hard to remove state barriers. They want a full uh, national licensure portability. They call it licensure portability. Uh, if they can't even spell privileges right, I have great doubts about their ability to get the rest of it right. So that's what's happened uh, nationally. Now on a more local level in South Carolina, we have a group called iSelect. Anybody here from iSelect? Um, good docs. However, uh, it's about the money. And so they, a company set up uh, to hire a couple of doctors to serve as after hours 1-800 phone-a-doc consultants. And the medical board, after finding out about this, said no. The, it's a online, uh, fill out a form, pay a credit card, and within 20 minutes you get a phone call back from a doctor, ask you some questions, and they will phone in a prescription or tell you to see your doctor, your primary care doctor which is not a bad option. Um, they were sanctioned. The two doctors quit, and uh, now I select, it says, we still want to do this, so last year we set up a requirement for them to have a Medicaid pilot pro uh, program, and we proposed this through the Board of Medical Examiners, that they would take after hours call for primary care practice groups. Remember, in, in South Carolina, new um, uh, Medicaid recipients through DHHS have to have a medical home. And so these would be the backup physicians, the on-call docs, for those patients who have primary care physician medical home assignees, as long as they see those pri that primary care doctor within one year, they would be the backup physicians uh, initially. And we have a six-month trial period that we're going to see the results of at our medical board meeting in Columbia next week. Um, and they are required to report both to uh, DHHS and medical board data results in uh, outcome uh, and output. Now, output means the number of patients seen, the number of patients prescribed for, the number of patients referred back to their primary care doctor. That's output, as opposed to outcome. Now, outcome means what happened to the patient. Is this quality care? And that's determined by three things. The actual physical outcome, did the patient get cured or at least get treated appropriately and better? Number two, patient satisfaction surveys, and that's the only part of the equation. Number three, most importantly, primary care physician satisfaction surveys, because this group is now required by their protocol, and I know this is way too small to read from any, I can't even read this with a magnifying glass up close, but uh, they go through a very detailed protocol now that we help them with, and they can refer back to the primary care doctor. Uh, they can contact the primary care doctor the next day to schedule an appointment. They can try to even reach the primary care doctor that night if possible, but remember a lot of primary care doctors don't have a 24-7 on-call system. So uh, 
we have yet to see the uh, first six months results, and uh, John, maybe at our next bioethics committee, we can talk about that too. But this is a pilot program for telemedicine that may actually work as a model for patients having access to doctors who don't have a 24-7 reachable primary care doctor, which I think may be a good thing. And uh, uh, last year, um, uh, Health Human Services, Tony Keck, wrote Dr. Koster, practice guidelines, moving forward with this. He, he supports it, but I'm not sure he understands all the various ramifications that we've required uh, as part of this. Now, there are some examples that don't work. Is Dr. Winter here today? I expected Alan to show up on this one. No? Dr. Alan Winter in Lexington, uh, many of us know, a good family practice doctor, has been very interested in telemedicine. He claims that he designed the system for the state of Utah in 2001. And he has presented this uh, presentation a number of times. He presented it to us last year at the Board of Medical Examiners. Non-visit care, in other words, no patient face-to-face uh, -face interaction, only structured data will work. And the bottom line is this, uh, a phone system uh, is, is very familiar, all, all of us, if we are dealing with a patient that we know ourselves. And uh, then he uh, went, goes into the email and the telemedicine uh, by ver its various formats, but he's promoting a structured, secure email e-visit system um, but not connecting to an electronic health records. This is just between the patient and the e-doctor. He calls them e-doctors, okay? So what's, an, what's his prime example of an e-doctor? Well, this is his prime example. Here's Dr. Winter himself, actually. Um, the world's first e-visit via smartphone, September 2006. And he is texting uh, or emailing his doctor from his smartphone uh, requesting a prescription. And in fact, he was part of a national group that published this article, Mayo Clinic Proceedings, Safety of Prescribing PDE5 Inhibitors via E-Medicine. Now, Dr. Leon Bullard is here, part of our bioethics committee. Dr. Bullard, what kind of medicines, uh, are, are, what's the, the common trade name for the most common PDE5 inhibitor? Viagra. So he is... Here's a healthy looking guy phoning or emailing his doctor for a prescription Viagra. My question is, was he texting or emailing his doc for a Viagra for a hot date that night? You know, I'm not sure that's a wise use of telemedicine because if you can do that with a doctor you have an established relationship with, that's one thing. If you do it with a totally unknown doctor, that's a whole nother ball of wax. What scares me even more is this, as a major threat to the public health the system that I work in in DHEC is sexualhealth.com. Now we all are familiar with the storefront where you can walk in and order your own lab test. Who's your daddy now .com kind of thing. Um, and, and you can walk in and order your own lipid profiles or fatigue profiles or whatever you want and you pay hundreds of dollars for it. Your insurance company may or may not pay for that and then they give you the results without counseling. Well we've the medical board has required, a, again, counseling system on those kind of storefronts. Now we have this new, and, and this is not the only one, this is just a prime example, sexualhealth.com, and they have some stores here in South Carolina where you go in and have some blood drawn, and you pee in a cup, and you get the results phoned to you by a counselor. They have counselors. Now that will tell you about uh, and give you answers to your questions, but boom, you can get a prescription. You can get a phone in. Five minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's the big question there because there is no reporting to public health. There is no contact tracing. If you have an STD, uh, you had to get it from somebody, but this company makes no provision for following state law or reporting of sexually transmitted diseases. And we think this is a very bad example of telemedicine uh, here. Um, John, if, if I could ask you to hand these out to the group. Uh, a couple of years ago, the swine flu pandemic uh, triggered a lot of questions about uh, the use of Tamiflu for flu, which is appropriate because Tamiflu not only makes people feel better, it reduces hospitalizations, pneumonia, and death. So, and it's a very safe drug. So 
Those of us in public health were trying to convince doctors to use Tamiflu for patients with flu. But also, public health guidelines for years have called for prophylaxis of household contacts of the influenza patients. Same thing with pertussis, whooping cough. Those are the three big conditions. And by the way, pertussis is the most contagious bacterial infection known. And so in 2009, we passed this policy of PEP recommended and approved by the medical board. In other words, your license is safe harbored. Walter, you have nothing to fear because this is now uh, official state policy. Last year, we had a nice presentation by State ACOG to please add STDs in there. And you'll see by the handout there that there are three STDs that you can write a prescription for for somebody you have never and will never lay eyes on. A woman with pap smear trichomonas shows up. She gets a single dose of metronidazole, and her partner should get it too. Had a patient in private practice. Same thing happened. Brought a prescription for Bubba and say, Give this to Bubba, tell Bubba no more love until he takes his pills the same time you take your pills. She said, Dr. Ball, you better give me about three more of those prescriptions. But the point is that there are those three STDs you see on your sheet there that you can phone in prescriptions for or write a prescription for for someone that you have never laid eyes on. That's telemedicine, but it is in accordance with national standards of care public health guidelines. And so the medical board has allowed these exceptions as part of our policies uh, to telemedicine. So the medical board is not um, um, rigid on this regard. We will allow and expand these exceptions again and again. Um, um, MTALA, there are some exceptions there too. You can read on the medical board website. And then the latest thing to hit was a bill by Dr. Chris Crawford. Was Chris here today? I thought I saw him here at the meeting yesterday. But anyway, Dr. Crawford uh, wants both parties in the teleconsultative services to be reimbursed by health insurance companies because they're not doing that. The stroke center at MUSC are not getting reimbursed. The emergency room doctor is, but the stroke company, uh, the stroke uh, group at MUSC has not always been reimbursed by not all insurance companies. So through the Insurance Act, he proposed this bill, which defines telemedicine. We're in and the medical board in favor of this. This means interactive audio and video. We like that. Consults, consultant site is at MUSC, referring site, physical site of patient. But what's missing from that is that there is no uh, primary care provider for the patient in his bill. His bill further goes on to mean the health care provider uh, and, and so forth for the re, uh, uh, um, consultant site, but not for the referring site may include a registered nurse in a school or prison setting, which was bizarre, and, and then uh, must be reimbursed in the same manner as in-person consultation. So far, so good. And then he threw in this section here um, that the board can authorize other forms of telemedicine, which became confusing. So just a few weeks ago, he amended this and tossed it out of the insurance and put it into the general health care so, uh, chapter 44 section, and what happened in the State House was they adjourned debate uh, because they didn't have enough time to debate it thoroughly, and there was no time for the crossover deadline for this Tuesday for it to go to the State House, I mean, for the, to the State Senate, and so this is now tabled for the year. Uh, but basically what Dr. Crawford is trying to do is get reimbursement for both parties in the consultative service, which is good, but we uh, just don't want him to change the definition of telemedicine. We want to continue that personal face-to-face -face interaction that we all feel is so critically important to both the art and the practice of medicine. Thank you very much.